All right, so this is a multi-part problem, but in the beginning, I'm given this vector field v of x, y, z, which is negative y, x, z, and m1. And that is the circular cylinder centered around the z-axis of radius 5 between z equals negative 7 and z equals 7 oriented outward. So I've already drawn it here. Let's go ahead and just write in like what the radius is. and my boundaries for z. So I'd like to use the divergence theorem to calculate the flux of v through the cylinder, but the cylinder is not closed. So the first thing I want to do is find a convenient closing surface for it. So I want something that's going to make it a closed object. Right now I've only got the sides of the cylinder, so it would make sense to add a top and a bottom, right? So I'm going to say that my closing surface is m2, and then that's going to be the union of the top of the cylinder and the bottom of the cylinder. And I need to parameterize those. So let's go and do the top first. I'm going to parameterize in terms of u and v, but I want to think about making a circle in the x, z, ah, excuse me, x, y kind of plane area that sits at z equals 7. So I know the third component is just going to be the constant 7. And now I want to make a circle, so I can assign u to be the radius and v to be like theta, and I'll get u cosine v, u sine v. And now I want to parametrize the bottom, which is going to be almost exactly the same, but now I'm just going to change the k component to be negative 7 instead of positive 7. Okay, and then I know the radius of that cylinder is 5, so I'm going to have u go between 0 and 5. And the cylinder goes all the way around. I'm not looking at a half cylinder or anything, so I'm going to say v goes between 0 and 2 pi. And those intervals are going to be the same for both r1 and r2. So now I want to calculate the flux of V over M2, so those two circles. And to do that, I'm just going to use the definition of flux, which is the double integral over area of F, the vector field evaluated at this parametrization, dotted with our U cross our V. So let's go ahead and do our one first. And let's find f of r1. So to do that, everywhere I see an x, I'm going to put u cosine v. Everywhere I see a y, u sine v. Everywhere I see a z, 7. So that gives me negative u sine v, u cosine v, 7. And now I want to find our u cross our v, so I can take their our u and our v, so I can take their cross products. So I'm just going to differentiate each term up here with respect to u. So I'm going to get cosine v sine v zero. And now let's find our v. So it's going to be negative u sine v, u cosine v, 0. I'm going to just take the partial derivatives of each term with respect to v. All right, and now I want to find their cross product. So to do that, I'm going to use a matrix and cofactor expansion. But first, I need to make myself a little bit of room.
So I just moved R1 and R2 up a little bit so that I'll have some more space. So now let's make this three by three matrix. The top column is, excuse me, the top row is going to be the vector components i, j, and k. Second row is going to be R1 sub u. And the third row is going to be R1 sub v. So I've got them. And now to find the vector components, I'm going to use a cofactor expansion. So to find the i component, I'm going to cut the top row and cut the column that has i in it and then take the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix. And I see I've got a 0 column, so the determinant is going to be 0. And then for j, again, cut the top row. Now we're going to cut the column that has j in it. And I've got the 2 by 2 matrix cosine v0, negative u sine v0. And again, it's determined it's going to be 0 because I have a 0 row. And now let's do k. So now I'm going to cut that 0 row that has a k in it. Uh, column, excuse me. That's going to help us out a lot. So I just want to find this determinant. So along the main diagonal, I get u cosine squared v. And then I want to subtract a negative u sine squared v. And you can use a trig identity to see that this is just going to equal u. All right. And now I want to dot that with f of r1. So 0 times 0, and I get 7u. All right. So now I want to integrate that over the uh, bounds for u and v that I set earlier. So I'm ready to integrate, and I'm going to integrate with respect to v first. So 7u is treated like a constant. When I integrate, I'm going to get 7uv. which I want to evaluate from v equals 0 to v equals 2 pi. So plug in a 2 pi and I get 14u, plug in 0 and I get 0. So I've got 14 pi u to integrate with respect to u. And that's going to give me 7 pi u squared. Evaluated from 0 to 5. So I plug in 5 and I get 175 pi, plug in 0, and I get 0. And I am all set for R1. So that's half of the flux through our closing surface. I finished the top of the cylinder. Now I just need to do the bottom. All right, so now I need to find the partial derivatives for R2. So let's find R2 sub u. So just take the partial derivative of each term with respect to u. So I'm going to get cosine v sine v0. Now let's find its partial derivative with respect to v. So I've got negative u sine v, u cosine v, 0. And this should look familiar to you because it's actually the same partial derivatives I got for r1. Because the k component is constant in both and it goes to 0, that's the only way they differ. So their cross product is going to be the same. And I'm not going to work, out, work it out again. But I know that's going to be. 0, 0, u.
But that cross product is supposed to give me a vector that is normal to my surface. And with u being positive from 0 to 5, this is going to orient straight up. But I need to orient out, so I'm going to switch that to be 0, 0, negative u. So the orientation of the bottom of the cylinder will be down like it's supposed to be. So now I just need to find f of r2. So just like before, everywhere I see an x, I'm going to put a u cosine v. Everywhere I see a y, u sine v. And everywhere I see a z, 0, 0, 7. So I get negative u sine v, u cosine v, negative 7. And when I dot that over here with 0, 0, negative u, I am just going to get 0 times plus 0 plus 7u. And that's actually the same dot product that I got for R1. So I'm going to skip the integration again, and I know that the flux through the bottom of the cylinder is going to match the flux through the top, and again it's going to be 175 pi. So I get the flux through M2 to be 350 pi. So that's part B, and then C asks us to calculate the flux of V through the entire surface M, so M1, the outside of the cylinder, plus the closing surfaces we added. So that we can use the divergence theorem for. So let's think about divergence. It is the partial derivative with respect to x of the i component plus the partial derivative with respect to y of the j component plus the partial derivative with respect to z of the k component of the vector. So for the i term, I get 0, since y isn't a function of x. Likewise, for the j term, the partial derivative of x with respect to y is 0. And then the partial derivative of z with respect to z is 1. So I've got the divergence of my vector to just equal 1. And then the divergence theorem says that I can find the flux through M if I integrate that divergence over volume. Well, since divergence is constant, I can just multiply by the volume of that cylinder. And since I have a formula that will give me that volume, I don't actually need to compute an integral. So let's recall what the volume of a cylinder is, and it's pi r squared h, and I'm given r to be 5, so that's going to be 25 for r squared, and then I'm not given an h, but I know that z goes between negative 7 and 7, so that gives me a total height of 14. So that gives me 350 pi for the flex through the whole cylinder. And then the last part of this problem asks for the flux of F, excuse me, V through M1, which is really what I've been trying to find all along. So I know that the flux through the whole cylinder, so that 350 pi, equals the flux through M1 plus the flux through M2. So 350 pi equals 350 pi plus the flux through M1, which makes the flux through M1 equal to 0.
newton meters squared.